I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. Again, welcome on behalf of my colleagues, Rob Lang and Caitlin Saladino. We're pleased to have you with us tonight and pleased to present our next pub in our public lecture series. Thanks again to our colleagues here at Greenspun College for allowing us to use this facility and helping us record tonight's event. We always try and present timely topics when you, when you schedule things months and a year in advance. That's somewhat of a crapshoot, but I think we succeeded tonight. Uh, <laughs> beyond even our expectations. Given the topic tonight, could I just ask, uh, could I ask any current or former uh, military personnel, if, if you served, to please rise so we can acknowledge. I'm just, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, let me get right to business and introduce our speaker tonight. We are both proud and privileged to have John Allen with us. I will not detail his entire biography per his instructions, even though I would like to. But uh, if you've seen our announcements, you, you, you know he has had a truly distinguished career and has led our military with distinction in some of the most dangerous and destabilized parts of the world. We could not have a more informed speaker on tonight's topic. John joined Brookings about four years ago, and this is his first visit with us, his first extended stay in Las Vegas. He has been this week and will continue the rest of the week meeting with UNLV students and faculty, both one-on-one -on -one and in the classroom, uh, bringing his unique experience and perspective to what might be the most important and perhaps most critical public policy issue facing our nation today. So please join me in welcoming John Allen. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen and, and students. It's great to uh, be with you uh, this evening. It's, it's wonderful to have the chance to offer this lecture. It's a great pleasure to be here from Brookings as part of the Brookings Mountain West program, which I have to tell you uh, from the context of Brookings uh, in Washington, we really view this as a treasure, a great opportunity and a great relationship. And we truly value it and we treasure it and we promote it as often as we can. Uh, I want to thank Bill Brown and Rob Lang uh, for the wonderful uh, welcome that they extended to me as I arrived here uh, from Singapore, uh, and, for, for, uh, and to thank Caitlin uh, Saladino uh, for setting everything up and, and making the transition in uh, seamless, very seamless, in fact. And of course, Bill's talking about this being a, a, a cool desert evening. I, I've been, this is my fourth week of uh, four weeks on the road. So I've had the chance to, uh, to experience a number of climactic extremes. Uh, I was in Seoul, Korea three weeks ago where it was 18 degrees. Uh, would then go to Abu Dhabi uh, and Riyadh where it was another different temperature, a different desert. Uh, and then ended up in Singapore where I flew into here. So you know, I, I relearned an old lesson that I probably should not have forgotten a few years ago and that is Never go to a place that's cold and hot on the same trip <laughs> because you've got to pack twice as much clothing. So as I was coming out of Seoul, Korea, I sent a box full of uh, cold weather clothing home to my wife. She says she got it. Um, I also understand that a couple of at least one or at least one, maybe a couple of sections of students are in here this evening. Uh, you don't have to admit it, uh, but you have my condolences in advance. Uh, as a professor a few years ago at the Naval Academy, where I taught political science, uh, I judged the class to be successful if anyone was awake at the end. <laughs> so my hope would, uh, would be that we'll have more success this evening. Uh, the topic this evening is, uh, is a bit grim, frankly, because I think uh, to be fully transparent, we're in a moment in American history, but in world history. It's actually quite challenging. And tonight I'd like to address the question, are we embarked on a new hundred years war. A war where we're condemned to fight an extremist enemy forever. 
So how does all this end and, and what do we do about it? Sadly, in the short term, there is no good answer to this question. How does this all end? For it frankly doesn't end, at least not on the course we're on and certainly not under the plans of this current administration. Indeed, under the vision of this administration, we're probably going to find ourselves in a multi-generational war, a true hundred years war with similar costs and chaos that is typified by the original hundred years war during the Middle Ages. But I do believe it doesn't have to be this way. There is a way out of this wilderness and this cycle of radicalization and extremism and violence and human misery. But it's going to require more of us as a people in the future than we seem willing to devote today. But I also believe that we're out of options on the path that we now tread, a path of steady conflict. We've got to move beyond reacting to one crisis after another. And our path must be other than a dark path that was laid out recently in the inaugural address where the president called upon uh, his powers of leadership to unite the civilized world to eradicate radical Islamic terrorism from the face of the earth. A term he re-emphasized last night in his speech to Congress. Despite the cautions of his superb and new national security advisor, who is a man who knows something about fighting and defeating terrorists more than almost anyone else that I know, and certainly more than anyone else in the White House. What this reveals about this administration's understanding of this crisis and what it portends for the price that we are going to pay for this kind of sloppy rhetoric is deeply troubling. For this is not the clash of civilizations that the Steve Bannons in the West Wing would have us believe. This is indeed a crisis of the human condition. Now having fought in Iraq against Al-Qaeda, and Afghanistan against the Taliban, and having helped the President to organize the global coalition to counter ISIL, three different enemies, three different wars, three different locations, my thinking has been crystallizing around the realities that we're facing today and the challenges that we must confront in the future as we relate to this and other groups. Indeed, as a people and as a country and as a member of the community of nations, we are far behind the power curve in understanding and defining the challenges that we face and in organizing in ways that can get us ahead of the spreading extremism whose most recent face is that of ISIS, the so-called Islamic State, what our Arab partners call Daesh. If we're ever to change our current situation, which is one I fear that consigns us to a reality of interminable conflict and war, we must seize the future and shape it or it will shape us. The great challenge we face as we move forward today against Daesh is in ensuring that our efforts and our energies and our solutions are adequate to the task, not just today, but tomorrow. ISIS is a symptom. It's a symptom of something bigger, something much darker, something the solution to which will require decades, indeed a generation probably, to address. And even then, it's not clear that there is an end to ISIS or its idea in a linear sense, as much as there's a desperate need for a fundamental change in the strategic environment. A change that will undercut the logic of an organization like ISIS or of Al-Qaeda and the accompanying unrelenting jihadism that we have to fight now to survive. I would propose that we have to face this challenge at three horizons, the near and the distant and the deep horizons. And while there's nothing exact or precise about these divisions, they're a useful intellectual framework for organizing our thinking. Now in close, at the near horizon, we have to fight. The president's right, we have to fight. Organizations like Daesh, Al-Qaeda, Abu Sayyaf, Jimas Lemia and others, they're on the march and they're in the attack. 
And as we face these groups over time, they're becoming more sophisticated and more capable. The Islamic State is much more capable than Al-Qaeda because it's adapted contemporary technology to link relatively disparate and far-flung extremist groups and increasingly criminal groups in ways that Al-Qaeda couldn't or didn't. The next group that we're going to face, the son of ISIS, <coughs> will be more sophisticated yet, and we must assume that, given the march of technology and the gradual change in these groups. <coughs> and so this threat is more pervasive. It's more connected and networked and more lethal. And we must both defend ourselves from moment to moment at the near horizon and defend those who cannot resist. And where we can, we have to rescue those who've gone down to this horror. To that extent and from long experience, we've learned that these groups must operate in three broad spheres, which are commingled, and which we must engage and attack simultaneously, the physical sphere, the financial sphere, and the information slant cyber sphere. And it is to that extent and in these three spheres that we're engaged in defeating Daesh today. In the physical sphere, our efforts are paying off in Iraq and Syria. The process is very slow because we've chosen to work primarily through indigenous forces. And this is complicated by political realities at the local, regional, and international levels. <clears throat> and I could digra digress here and spend the remainder of this presentation just talking about Syria and Russia and Turkey and Iran and the U.S. and the political complexities, which are as complex and as difficult as I've ever seen anywhere. <clears throat> Indeed, as we gather this evening, there are reports that the Turks are massing right now to attack the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are the U.S.-supported, Kurdish-led forces that have done virtually all of the fighting in northern Syria to defeat Daesh along the Turkish border, to take back key Daesh strongholds and locations, and the Turks are massing to attack our allies in northern Syria. This is going to enormously complicate the entire effort that we've had underway now for months to defeat Daesh to retake its administrative capital, if you will, the town of Raqqa on the Euphrates River. In the financial sphere where Daesh initially made substantial gains in self-sufficiency, we're shrinking its financial space by attacking its oil enterprise and by attacking its cash reserves, which were significant, because where Daesh conquered communities in Syria and Iraq robbed the banks, ultimately accumulating somewhere around $750 million worth of cash reserves. And now that we have found them, we are blowing them up, literally burning up their reserves. And concurrent with our activities in the other spheres, we're also contesting Daesh's efforts in the information space. And here, ladies and gentlemen, here is the decisive battle space in this war against Daesh, for this organization rides on a set of ideas, ideas that capitalize on and feed the factors that radicalize vulnerable and key elements of vast populations, reached through the skillful leveraging of modern information technologies in ways we've never seen before. I've never seen an organization like this that could wield information the way it can. Defeating ISIS in the physical sphere will never end this struggle. Strangling it in the, in the financial sphere will not leave it bereft of capacity to defeat this group and what will be an unceasing succession of these groups. We must kill the idea of Daesh as a solution to the causes of radicalization. And centrally, we must address the conditions themselves that give birth to these abominations. Doing this moves us towards the answer to the question, how does this end? And there is an answer, but it is complex. Interminable conflict cannot be the solution to dealing with Daesh and the other mutations of extremism. We must embrace a deep vision of the future. This will require the capacity to envisage 
strategic ends that we must achieve, ends that will require, indeed will demand, fundamental reforms in many countries, reforms to address the massive inequities within so many communities in the world that leave vast segments of the world's population without inclusion, without justice, without civil and human rights, without economic prospects for the future. In essence, in essence, they're left without hope. And these vast segments of the world's populations are enormously vulnerable to radicalization. These communities are increasingly characterized by an emerging youth bulge. Some would call it a youth surge. A demographic global megatrend across much of the Muslim tier, from Morocco in the northern tier of Africa to Mindanao and the Philippines. These youths, frustrated at their lot and angry at their limited opportunities, are radicalized under these circumstances. And they become fertile ground for extremist recruiters from Daesh and Al-Qaeda and Abu Sayyaf and others. In that distant future, which we must imagine, beyond the horizon of what we do to defend ourselves today, perhaps 15 years from now, we'll need to take collective action to strengthen and to build resilience in fragile and failing states under assault today. These measures will be strong in security, defense, and in the intelligence sector, but will also and must also emphasize judicial and economic reform to deliver both the promise of justice and the prospect of economic development. And above all, these reforms must address the pernicious and corrosive effects of corruption, which is one of the greatest breaks on governmental capacity and development and one of the greatest impediments to democracy. And looking farther into the future, at the deep horizon, perhaps a generation or more from today, certainly beyond my life, but not beyond the lives of many of you in here tonight who are going to have to make the difference. We have to envision a comprehensive set of reforms that can address and undercut so many of the underlying factors that have radicalized and polarized so many. These aren't unique or isolated or even unrelated conditions which we would find in, say, Sumatra or Bangladesh or in Karachi or in the Persian Gulf or across North Africa. The reasons for weak and or corrupt governance and the forces that combine to create fragile and failing states are nearly always the same. What we must face is the reality and the enormity of what it will take, what it will demand from a comprehensive grand strategy as we seek results at the deep horizon. For the cost of that strategy cannot be one that's based on eradication of an element of Islam. The cost in blood and treasure is untenable over the long term and does nothing to improve the human condition, while at the same time recruiting vast extremist forces to oppose us. Embracing a comprehensive strategy to achieve effect at the deep horizon will require that we think differently, think anew and differently about how we're organized within our own government. Think expansively about forming and the wielding of international coalitions and think comprehensively not just about how we formulate strategy, but as importantly, how we implement it as well. It would be difficult to overstate how big and how significant this undertaking will be. There are some who say it cannot ever happen, that we can never mobilize the kind of collective approach and resources that can fundamentally change the trajectory that we face. They could be right, but I hope to God they're not. For in truth, this trajectory is not promising. Apart from the issues of expanding radicalism and increasing virulent extremist groups, the implications of the global megatrends that we face are every day shaping our future, and they demand our attention now. In many ways, these global trends are not only at work, sculpting inexorably the geostrategic landscape, they are also the forces which, if left unaddressed, 
will likely expand and accelerate and feed the security challenges we'll face in the future. In fact, I would propose that they're inextricably linked. Our success will ultimately require that we account for the one while we address the other. And while I'll discuss these trends briefly over the next few minutes, they're normally considered to be five in number. The migration of wealth from west to east on the globe, that migration over the last generation, major demographic changes in the population of that portion of the region which is most at risk, rapid, uncontrolled urbanization, which worries me the most, the emergence of key technologies, and then the inexorable climate change which is coming at us increasing, increasingly creating resource scarcity. For example, wealth is moving away from the regions most in need of help. The demography out to 2050 does not favor the developed or the developing worlds whose populations will age, they will stagnate in numbers or shrink, while those of portions of the developing world will grow. And that segment of the population growing the fastest in that region is that between the ages of roughly 15, depending who's counting, 15 to 25 or 15 to 29, whose expectations for good governance, for individual justice, for basic human rights and economic opportunity will be increasingly frustrated. To illustrate just one aspect of the magnitude of this challenge, each year approximately 121 million adolescents turn 16 years of age. 89% of them, let's round it to 90, 90% of them are located in developing regions in the world. In employment alone, their economic prospects for most of what they want are grim. To that extent then, the so-called Arab Spring was, and I strongly believe this, a harbinger of the future. I think it's useful at this point to take a moment here to review what the Arab Spring in 2011 was and what it was not. First, what it was not. It was not a widespread religious upheaval. I was the deputy commander at the U.S. Central Command at the time, which owns the, the area of operations called the Middle East, the greater Middle East. And as we watched the conflagration of the Arab Spring unfold across the region, burning its way across North Africa towards us in the Middle East, we found through our intelligence resources that Al-Qaeda was caught as flat-footed as everyone else by the spontaneity of this upheaval. And while there was nothing amusing about the extent of this crisis, we found it supremely ironic that Al-Qaeda was now attempting to sprint out ahead of the unfolding instability to take credit for the widespread uprisings. Few were fooled by this ploy, <coughs> and few were convinced that Al-Qaeda was at the center of the causal factors of this upheaval. I'm not implying that there was no dimension of religion in this crisis, but Islam and being a Muslim were not fundamental to this phenomenon. What the Arab Spring was and remains was the result of a confluence of myriad, festering, unresolved, or simply insoluble generational factors. Incompetent, non-inclusive governance, <clears throat> an absence of justice, rampant, predatory corruption, massive inequality, women generally disenfranchised across the entire region, frustrated youthful populations, a lack of educational opportunities, and few economic prospects. It's a long list, it's a grim list, but that was the reason for the Arab Spring. And in one form or another, <clears throat> each of these factors were at work on that, that sad day in December of 2010. <clears throat> when the young Tunisian husband and father, Mohamed Bouazizi, <clears throat> dispossessed of his livelihood, a fruit stand. He was a fruit vendor. That's all he could do in that environment to put food on the table for his family. Taken from him by local corrupt officials, 
He was left utterly frustrated and despondent with his life, his lot in life, under a pervasive Tunisian tyranny. So he poured petrol on himself and lit himself a flame. And he would die in that act, an act that figuratively and literally set the region ablaze. Thus began the terrible summer of 2011, occurring at roughly the hundred year point in the wake of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, which had ruled the region for centuries. Long described as the sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire had held the region together for centuries through a loose system of regional and sub-regional patrimony, or provinces, which they called wilayats, and through the ruthless local suppression of indigenous tribal societies. With the victory of the Allies in World War I, the Allies would impose an administration or a mandate upon the former Ottoman provinces. This was the so-called mandatory period. And not surprisingly, the Europeans did little to replace the Ottoman rule with anything better. Indeed, one imperial rule was basically or essentially exchanged for another, except that the new rulers, the Europeans, had little real experience in the region and even less capacity than the Turks to understand and shape the social dynamics at work in these now liberated societies. Thus, most of the World War I states of the greater Middle East, most of the Arab states born in the aftermath of that war, were born inside boundaries they would never have drawn for themselves. They would be led by leaders they would most likely have never chosen for themselves. And they were governed by weak institutions that for the most part neither governed well nor governed humanely. And the elites of the region, they lived at a great material distance from the governed, from that element of the populations which would eventually be called in the modern era the Arab street, and from which such fury and turmoil would emerge over time. So as the West emerged from the war to end all wars, the conclusion of this devastating conflict didn't bring us an end of war. It would bring, as the great historian David Frumkin observed, a peace to end all peace. And indeed, the resulting mandatory period from 1922 onward would plant the seeds in the greater Middle East, which in the second decade of the 21st century would render a cruel harvest called the Arab Spring. As this conflagration of 2011 engulfed the region, one dictator after another went down. While by and large the monarchies held together, the di dictatorships folded largely because of the inherent fragility of their systems, preventing as they had the normal evolutionary social venting that accompanies social progress and the effects of modernity, and the development of political and institutional maturity and viable political opposition parties. In essence, they possessed, possessed little resiliency and virtually no shock absorbency. The monarchies, on the other hand, had their own problems with governmental institutions, but had not lost their deep and stabilizing reach into the tribal societies of the region. And that reach, and having plenty of resources to quiet dissent, <coughs> left them in a better state than the dictatorships, but every country in the region was destabilized in one form or another by the events of 2011. And from the Arab Spring, the emergence <coughs> of civil wars across the region only magnified the human misery and accelerated the flight of millions, the largest refugee displacement since World War II. Libya and Syria as conflicts now seemingly irreconcilable. Yemen seems beyond the reach of any coherent peace process. I was just with the Emiratis and the Saudis and they cannot extract themselves from this morass. It's a failed state, but it's also a civil war. And that civil war is stoked by the Saudi-Iranian Cold War. And Iraq, though not technically a civil war or a failed state, 
was perilously close to going over the edge by the onslaught of the Islamic State in 2013 and 14, which itself drew its organizing principles and comparative strength from the Syrian civil war going on next door. The tinder for the fire of 2011, the Arab Spring, was to be found in widespread social and economic frustration by youthful populations, centered in teeming cities, the results of which were communicated near simultaneously over vast distances on the internet and through social media. And so we see in the emergence of this crisis the intersection of the megatrends and the causal factors of radicalization. And this does not bode well for the future. So let me return to the megatrends for a few minutes. Urbanization will be one of the greatest challenges we face as we increasingly see populations moving into the cities. By 2050, nearly three quarters of the world's population will be in megacities. Already 20% of the world's population lives in one of the world's 27 megacities. These teeming cities will be harder and harder to govern and to sustain as infrastructure is stretched to the breaking point and masses of poor will shelter into what are becoming known today increasingly as mega slums. No go areas attached to these cities, essentially existing beyond the writ of national, regional and municipal governments and locally governed by criminal or non-state actors, terrorist groups. And we're seeing it today in Lagos, Nigeria, in Karachi, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. Just before the Olympics, the Brazilians had to mount a large police and military effort to take back large numbers of neighborhoods in, in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Military operations where they sustained heavy casualties. At least one police helicopter was shot down by what they think was a shoulder-fired heat-seeking missile. To that end, be careful of the term, ladies and gentlemen, ungoverned spaces, because it's often applied to those areas within the mega slums. <clears throat> that term can create a false notion of what's going on in these areas, because for sure there is governance going on inside the mega slums, but it's usually completely at odds with our own Westphalian notions and is a source of massive radicalization and an incubator to extremist groups and other non-state actors. And military planners are now using the term feral cities, wild cities, to describe how extreme this trend could be out to the year 2050. And it's going to get hotter, ladies and gentlemen. Last summer, I'm, and I'm speaking to a group of people who know about hot, last summer was the hottest summer on record. Hotter even than the previous summer, which was the hottest summer on record. In fact, eight of the last 10 summers are the hottest summers on record. Today, it was 64 degrees in Antarctica. 64 degrees, the hottest temperature ever recorded in that continent. And the heat will complicate and it will enrage weather patterns that are essential to agriculture and resources now already scarce like water will become a costus belli, a reason for people to go to war with each other. By 2050, a global population will exceed 8 billion people. We'll need 50% more energy, 40% more water, and 35% more food. And finally, the rise of technology which carries such great promise for us all will also create the means to network with nearly completely secure communications. The angry, disenfranchised and radicalized masses in ways that will likely outstrip the capacity of less sophisticated or impoverished local or national governments to compete with these non-state actors or these highly sophisticated criminal networks. And finally, if it's even recognizable at all, the rules-based system of global intercourse, the system the U.S. authored out of the ashes of World War II and in the aftermath of the Cold War will be sorely pressed to account for the realities of these megatrends. And we're seeing this already. 
with a resurgent Russia and an increasingly assertive and even muscular China. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen this before. We've seen these grim circumstances before in our history. In fact, I would propose that they seemed insurmountable before. But it took visionaries able to see beyond the politics of the moment, visionaries who had deep insights about the future, who could imagine communities and organizations and, and ways and means to achieve a strategy outcome beyond the horizon of their own lives. The containment strategy of the Cold War, derived by the United States and her allies and partners, was nothing less than a generational strategy. A generational strategy to limit the single greatest existential threat to the West that we've ever faced. A nuclear-armed Soviet empire intent on enslaving the West and already enslaving tens of millions in Eastern and Central Europe. A Soviet Union intent on our defeat. And as I said a few moments ago, we must think as broadly and differently today as they did then. For the containment strategy was, for, was far more than simply a military strategy. We knew this, not, the solution would not be a military strategy. Indeed, it can be argued the single greatest accomplishment of the era and the one of the principal knockout blows of the Soviet Union wasn't its military encirclement by the West, wasn't a military strategy, but rather the political and economic integrative forces alternative to, to communism presented by the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan. If we're ever then to get to the left of radicalization, if we're ever to reduce the pell-mell spread of violent extremism, <clears throat> there can be no solution to these problems that we've raised this evening without a comprehensive, long-term, grand strategy which not only embraces the interagency approach within our government, but also an international approach, a robust coalition of the community of nations. And what comes to mind immediately is something that looks very much like the coalition that has been organized today to counter ISIL. With, with at its beating heart, the Arab states, those states whose population contain large Muslim concentrations, for they must be central to the outcome. And it depends on your mindset here. Are Muslims the problem or are Muslims the solution? I prefer that Muslims are the solution. And I would also contend that for this grand strategy to work, it must span a swath of the Earth's surface, which includes not only the traditional Middle East, but also the northern tier of Africa, portions of Central and South Asia, and the key states of Southeast Asia, with large or majority Muslim populations. And as I will tell you, I just came from Singapore where among other people I met with the Prime Minister. There is a deep, deep concern about the radicalization of the youth of that region and they're being embraced by these extremist organizations. And if we're able to fashion a generational grand strategy, then the really hard part begins, the implementation. And my own experience has taught me that strategies, good, bad, or indifferent, are for naught without a carefully crafted implementation plan or a follow through. <clears throat> and this will be, as is often said in the military, the long pull in the tent. And if American leadership was important to the formulation of the strategy, it will be essential to its implementation. Without exaggerating the issue, the enormous gravity of this undertaking is striking. With no contemporary analog except perhaps the formation of the United Nations and its family of agreements and organizations at the end of the Second World War, or the development of the containment strategy with the Marshall Plan as its centerpiece, or maybe even something you know about out here, the Manhattan Project. My point is, we will never get to the left of radicalization and violent extremism without the decision by the world's leadership to commit once and for all to lift the necessary resolve 
to concentrate the resources to solve this crisis. And as hard as this may be, when one considers historically the size of the stakes of the previous measures which I've mentioned, I'm encouraged. This, in fact, can happen. We can get organized. We can focus the resources. For we've had the moral and intellectual capacity to do it before, and I believe we can do it again. And yes, it was enormous. And yes, it was hard. And not without risk, or without setback, or even without war, sometimes to the very nuclear brink. But the logic of what we attempted at that time was sufficiently sound, and the vision was sufficiently clear that it survived as an idea and as a strategy to carry us through the darkness of the Cold War. We are, as a people, up to this. We have to be, because perpetual conflict cannot be the birthright which we bequeath our precious children and their babies. The problem we face now is that our own administration seeks to take us in the other direction. I think the utterly wrong direction. By making this crisis about Islam and being Muslim and by militarizing the solution. The dark vision expressed in the inaugural address of the U.S. leading the civilized nations in the eradication of radical Islamic terrorism from the face of the earth, quote unquote, hasn't united the community of nations. Indeed, it's begun to separate them from the United States. The ill-conceived travel ban was the first act in this drama, followed nearly immediately by the president's untoward call for the United States to seize Iraqi oil. Now, I'm still tied in with the sheikhs of the Al-Anbar province with whom I fought to defeat Al-Qaeda. By the way, they're all online, and they're all on Facebook. <laughs> and I got a face blast from their Facebooks. The incongruity of all this would be laughable if it's not tragic. Not only did our principal allies in the fight against Salafi jihadist organizations like Daesh, not only did our principal allies, the Iraqis, who are dying by the hundreds every day with Americans fighting alongside them to liberate their country from Daesh, they wake up one morning to find they can no longer travel to the United States. And then they have to wonder why the United States president threatened to take their oil. Look, <laughs> so many of our closest friends on the planet are left to wonder why would any of these countries want to be part of that so-called group of civilized nations, led by America, if the underlying strategy is an eradication strategy, which will condemn us to a hundred years war. The reality, of course, is that we have to fight to protect our way of life and that of our closest friends and partners from this jihadist scourge. But our deeds and our words are accelerating the very radicalization that the American administration is seeking to eliminate. And as I said, we've been here before. When other Americans with real strategic vision could see into the future, George Marshall, and George F. Kennan, men like them, people like them, were able to fashion a way out of the wilderness that would become the Cold War. And for his contributions to peace, or put differently, his ability to see beyond the need for war, George Marshall would eventually be recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize. In him, we have both the prototype thinker and the prototype plan. In 1947, he, in describing the Marshall Plan before an audience at Harvard, George Marshall would offer the kind of view to shape our thinking today. We should take heart at these words, because they blazed a trail that we can still follow. He would say, quote, our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger and poverty and desperation and chaos. Its purpose should be the revival of a working economy in the world so as to permit the emergence of political and social conditions in which free institutions can exist. Such assistance, I am convinced, must not be on a piecemeal basis as, uh, as various crises develop. 
Any assistance that the, this government may render in the future should provide a cure rather than a palliative. Any government that is willing to assist in the task of, of recovery will find full cooperation, I am sure, from the part of the United States government. Any government which maneuvers to block the recovery or other governments, that those governments cannot expect help from us. Furthermore, governments, political parties, and groups which seek to perpetuate human misery in order to profit therefrom, politically or otherwise, will encounter the opposition of the United States, end quote. So I believe we can envision, and I believe we can fashion, and I believe we can implement the kind of long-term grand strategy to address this crisis. Indeed, as I said at the beginning, from my perch, and I got a little experience at this, I would also contend that finding the solution is no longer an option. In 1862, as the horizon was darkening for an America sinking into the abyss of the Civil War, President Lincoln admonished Americans to rise to the crisis they faced. And he would say, quote, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, we must think anew and we must act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves and then we will save our country. So we must think anew, we must act anew, and we must seize the future to save our country, if not to save all humankind, and if not for us and for our children and our grandchildren and their children. So are we facing a new hundred years war? I pray we are not, for we are facing a hundred years struggle to defeat a virulent ideology, but more nobly, more nobly, to lift millions out of darkness through reform and change. Reform and change, not unending battle and war. And it will take a generation or more to solve this, but it has to start somewhere. It has to start now. Let it start with us. Let it start with the students in this room because we have no other options. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention this evening. Bill, tell me how much time we have. We do have five or ten minutes or so for some questions. Okay, yes sir, please. Yes sir, uh, you used the, the term of fragile and failing states. And I think rightfully pointed out the, uh, after the end of the Ottoman Empire, all things were divided up. Yeah. More than a decade ago, in a monograph for JSAW, I wrote that state, uh, the state is a failing concept. How do you, of course, State Department took umbrage with that, but how do you reorganize, if you've talked about this, you've got organizations you know, on the ground that just don't make sense, how do we bring that together? What is the macro social organization of the future? I'm not entirely clear I had your question. Um, what we need to do, each state is going to be different in how we approach them. Uh, each set of problems within those states uh, are unique. They're similar, but they're unique. Uh, and as we have done with the most recent coalition to deal with the Islamic State, we focus those particular members of the coalition with either functional expertise or regional affinity to that particular nation to begin the process of helping them to arrest their fragility or to arrest their failing. Each one will be different. What it takes for us ultimately to prevent Jordan from collapsing will be different than that which we'll need to apply to prevent Egypt from collapsing. So it's going to require that uh, each country has a separate plan. What I would propose is that there are some states that today we can't afford to permit to collapse because they have such great strategic uh, importance to us. Indonesia, for example, Jordan, 
Egypt. The United States cannot respond to a military contingency in the Middle East without flying through Egyptian airspace or using the Suez Canal. If those were to be denied to us, much of our capacity to react in the Middle East would be zero. So each of those states would be categorized by those that require the greatest assistance first, those who are not immediately under threat of collapse, but could be over a long period of time, and we have a different recipe for them in terms of the kinds of institution capacity building that we undertake. And then there are the states that potentially could be under threat, are not immediately under threat, and those will take longer, but we'll work with them longer to, to make them proof from potential instability over the long term. So it requires us to prioritize, it requires us to, to uh, assemble the resources, it requires us to focus elements within the coalition to prevent these states from going over the edge. And once we have prevented that, to begin to build genuine state governing institutions to change the human condition in those countries. It's not gonna be easy, it's gonna take a long time. Uh, does that get to some of your question? Basically, yes. I I could go on. Yes, but, you, you, and I could go on. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> thank you. That's a very good question. Yes, sir, please. Great. But, General, yeah. uh, I, I, my question is kind of about the structure of the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, my numbers may be wrong, but I understand that we have the same number of generals that we did back in World War II today. And uh, as an example, uh, the last time I, I checked, there were six generals in Iraq and about 2,000 troops. And uh, back in World War II, that would, 2,000 troops would just be you know, controlled by like a lieutenant. Are we too top heavy in our military? Well, I, I don't think I ever knew of a 6,000 troops com controlled by a lieutenant. That'd be a very dangerous I thing, don't you? <laughs> don't, don't, we, don't we think? Um, uh, you know, I, I get your point. Are we, are we top heavy? I he think. He didn't stand up. Huh? He didn't stand yeah. up when you asked him. Yeah. <laughs> I know where he's coming from. Um, I think the difference in many respects uh, and why, and I'm not disputing your numbers, I, we have fewer generals today. The Marine Corps has had 80 generals for a, about 175,000 troops for many, many years, and no more generals when we had 205,000 at the height of the wars. That's not many generals in the big scheme of things. Um, what we do have today is a, a larger number of folks that we call general officers of the joint forces. Uh, the f when I commanded our forces in Afghanistan, uh, I was a Marine general, and the Marine Corps by law ranks rates two, four, two full four-star generals by law, Commandant and Assistant Commandant. At the time I retired, <coughs> we had six generals, six four-stars, four of them in the joint force, because we don't fight as services anymore. We fight as large joint entities, and that requires uh, a family of general officers to fight those joint forces. You think we need a supreme, like a five-star general to fight this, this, this you know, uniform, no, I, uniform I, the... I think, no, we're organized in our services, and th these are good questions you're asking. We, we have 10 uh, what we call combatant commands, uh, and they are all led by four stars. I was the deputy commander of the combatant command that is responsible for the Middle East and Central Asia. It's called the Central Command. There are six of these that are oriented on geographic regions. Northern Command is the United States. Southern Command is the Inter-American area. Uh, Central Command is, as I said, the Middle East, the European Command, the Pacific Command, and the Africa Command. And then we have functional commands. The Transportation Command gets you there. There's like a lot of commands here. Yeah, but you, but you gotta divide the world up in ways to focus. Mm -hmm and, the, and the, the ability to apply forces and to have war plans that are unique to those areas. The Special Operations Command, I think we're all agreed that that's a pretty important one these days. And there's you know, a couple of others, the Strategic Command, which is all about our nuclear weapons and cyber warfare. Uh, those are all joint forces, and it requires a group of joint generals and admirals to lead those forces. So it appears that we have a lot, but the command and control to be able, at, a, at the snap of, of a set of fingers, to go to war is what the United States needs to be ready to do. And we can't take the time to form those commands out of whole cloth. We've chosen as a nation to form them and hold them ready to go so that we can fight the drop of a hat if necessary. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we have a high superstructure of, uh, it's primarily for strategic and operational command and control. Go on, maybe it's too easy to go to war. We go on. No, it's, we don't wanna go to war. We don't want that to be easy, but we also don't want going to war to be an afterthought. Because if it's an afterthought, uh, 
and the military wasn't part of the grand strategy of the United States, in other words, we'll get around to war when everything else fails, that's the wrong way to do it because when you get around to war, that's all you've got left as an option. I spent 15 years fighting in these wars. I don't want to fight in wars anymore. What I want is for the military to be part of people's thinking for the corros corrosive, excuse me, the coercive, the coercive value of the military and diplomacy is what gives the American word its strength and power. It causes our enemy to, enemies to fear us and our allies to respect us. And if we're only an afterthought in the planning, in the national leadership, then when the time comes to use the military, it's too late for all other options and then it's just a war. And we don't want to operate that way. Yes, ma'am. I'll get you. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead, please. My question is following up from Ms. Demlin down here. I understand what you said about the countries that cannot be allowed to fail. Yep. But what about the areas that are so blurred and confusing, like the Kurds and the Turks that you started out to sure. talking about? Yep. How do you sort that out? It's a great question. <clears throat> when it's a great question. When, I, uh, when the Islamic State invaded Iraq, President Obama called several of us into the White House for a conversation. Uh, and he said, give me your thoughts on how we solve this. And I said to the president, the, the first question you need to answer for Mr. President is this region was defined by something called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was uh, an arrangement of the states of that region by the Europeans. None of the people of that region would have ever organized themselves that way. So I said to him, Mr. President, what is your outcome here? Bef before you ask me what my recommendation is, I need to know what you think the outcome is. Are we going to reestablish the arrangement of the Sykes-Picot Agreement? Or are we going to let the people organize themselves? And his response was, we've got to go back to what the Sykes-Picot Agreement was. And then once we've reestablished that, then we, be we can begin the process of remaking the, the, the region in its own form. So we, we actually support, at some point, the Kurds having their own independence. But, and the Kurds are great people. They're wonderful people. And, and the allies that we have in the Kurdish regional government in Iraq have been very close allies. But they're horribly organized right now. There are Iranian Kurds. There are Turkish Kurds. There are Iraqi Kurds. There are Syrian Kurds. And for a very brief moment in 1919, uh, some real visionary diplomats drew a circle around all of those people and determined that there would be a Kurdistan. But the great powers determined that that would never be the case, that a Kurdistan would be too limited as a state. And so they broke it up. So the president's intent was, let's restore the status quo ante and then from there move into something that's more natural for the region. But we can't defeat Daesh and move into something uh, that's more suitable for the region at the same time. It just would not work. And I agree with him to that extent. Yes, sir, you've been very patient, I'm sorry. The craziness of ISIS is uh, intriguing, but uh, I really appreciate you. Uh, I was wondering what your opinion was on 30 seconds of totally off the subject. That's why I should have talked to you afterwards. But um, what do you think of this North Korean? I think this North Korean situation is, is more real and threatening to American land than any ISIS situation. I couldn't agree with you. Uh, when I testified to be commander in Afghanistan, there were three people that day on the panel who testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee for my confirmation hearing. Me, uh, a fellow by the name of Bill McRaven, who you may have heard of, who was the SEAL that ran the raid to take down Osama bin Laden, and a great Army general by the name of J.D. Thurman, slow-talking fellow out of Alabama. He's just wonderful. So four hours we testified. I got 85% of the questions. I'm going to Afghanistan. Bill McRaven got congratulations, mostly. <laughs> J.D. Thurman got about two or three questions. And at the end, I went up to him and said, J.D., it was a great day to be J.D. Thurman. You got two or three questions. I got hammered. I said, but the reality, of course, is you're the commander of a conflict that could, that could break out in 72 hours and have two million men involved and go nuclear very quickly. I mean, this is one of the great strategic threats to American national security. Now, in his, <clears throat> in his New Year's Day address, Kim Jong-un, I'm not sure whether it's the dear leader or the popular leader or the, uh, I've, I've lost track. Um, it, it is his intention to, to boil, well, he, he's, he's got some power behind him. It's his intention to build an ICBM to reach the United States. And he's got submarine access. He's already, he's now successfully launched a submarine ballistic missile.
So the, the question we have to answer as a state, as a nation, is at what point, well, we don't want him to hit Las Vegas. Uh, we have to answer the question as a nation whether we're going to take that capability away from him. And that I, I would propose to you, having just come out of Seoul talking about those very issues, I would propose to you that that's going to be uh, high in the inbox of the current president. Uh, and as you remember, uh, President Trump, when he was apprised of the fact that Kim Jong-un was going to build an ICBM to strike the United States, he said, not going to happen. He tweeted it, by the way, so I'm sure, I'm sure that Kim Jong-un <laughs> <Kim Jong -un laughs> got it. So, uh, Yes, sir, please. What do you think we should, our position should be uh, in this Kurd-Turk situation if the Turks yep. invade or go after the, uh, the Kurds? Well, I think we have, first we have to protect our troops and defend ourselves. And it'll be very interesting to see how we do that. One is we move in closer to our Kurdish allies so that any strike on the Kurdish allies is a strike on the United States, which means the Turks are actually bombing a NATO ally. Uh, or, as other administrations might have considered, we move away from our Kurdish allies and let the Turks have at them. I don't know what's going to come, come from this. Uh, we've been dealing very closely with this element of uh, the Kurdish population. It's called the PYD. As uh, you may well know, the, the element that Turkey has gone to war with is that element of the Kurds that live inside Turkey. They're called the PKK. It's an old communist organization. A very capable terrorist organization. They've been fighting them now. I was negotiating with the Turks to get our bombers into Turkey. Very successful negotiations in 15. Uh, a week after the negotiations were completed, a PKK assassin killed two Turkish security officials who he believed had permitted the Islamic State with a suicide vest to blow up in front of, uh, in, inside a group of young Kurdish uh, uh, NGO. Uh, they, they were on a humanitarian mission to a place called Manbuj, uh, which was not Manbuj, Suruç. They were in Suruç getting ready to go into uh, Kobani, where all of the fighting had occurred. They were a humanitarian mission. The ISIL bomber got inside this young group, this group of young Kurds, and blew, blew them up. And uh, the PKK fighter assassinated two Turkish security officials. That relit the entire war off. And since then, the Turks have been fighting the PKK, and they believe that the PYD, below the Turkish border in northern Syria, they believe the PYD is no different than the PKK. Our view has been they're significantly different. The fighting arm of the PYD is the YPG, and American special operators have been working very closely with them. They have inflicted more damage on Daesh than any other group uh, that we have worked with to this point in the war. But the Turks don't see a difference between the two. And we've been trying to make the case that there is a difference. And my guess will be that under this administration, Rather than to see Americans be pulled away from the Turks and leave uh, the Kurds and leave them naked, I think we're going to we're going to hug them pretty tight. So we'll see. This will be a test for uh, President Trump very very early along. Students, I'd like to ask for students if you've got questions. You're awake. <laughs> Great. Yes, sir. Does military withdrawal play a role in your like grander vision of Middle Eastern reform slash? Do you think that could ever be framed as politically palatable to the current administration? Uh, withdraw and what to what to what end? What why would we withdraw? Uh, well, so like some thinkers think that military presence becomes a tool for recruitment for certain terrorist right. organizations. Do you think? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Actually, um, one of the things when when I, we talked to the president about going back into Iraq, we, we shouldn't have come out when we did. Now now we had to go back in. Um, was the way we would do this, and he consciously chose, and I. This is President Obama I'm talking about. He consciously chose, I believe, the right way to do this, which was for us to come in in relatively small numbers of trainers and special operators uh, to train the indigenous forces. You have something called the defeat mechanism. What is, what is going to be the defeat mechanism of the enemy you're facing? <clears throat> in other words, how are you going to do it? There were a lot of calls, if you'll recall, by the Congress to put in American brigades. Let's go back in heavy, let's defeat Daesh and get out of there. Look, we had 150,000 troops in Iraq for almost eight years, and we barely defeated Al-Qaeda. We're, we're not going to put 150,000 troops in to go after a bigger group than Al-Qaeda was going to be. So clearly the way to do this was, I think, the choice that President Obama made, which was a good choice. 
He didn't put enough in. I think he could have put more in, which would have accelerated our capacity to train the Iraqis to be the defeat mechanism. If the indigenous force, when you're fighting an organization like that, if the indigenous force is the defeat mechanism, and you then pull out our advisors, you have left in place the indigenous solution. If we do it, and we pull out, it typically leaves a vacuum. And it also, to your point, it also creates antibodies within the local population. That's one of the reasons the, the Iraq war, like it, hate it, don't have an opinion on it. The Iraq war that we created in 2003 has radicalized a huge amount of the Middle East population because of the size and the footprint of the United States. I think our proclivities are now when we see a, a crisis like this, as we did in Colombia. Most of you here perhaps have, are aware of what happened in Colombia over the years, but it's one of the great examples of the United States success in helping a country to defeat an organized criminal element, to defeat the drug enterprise, and to defeat the FARC, or a 50-year insurgency. Not because we did it ourselves, but because we helped with the right amount of resources and special operators to train the indigenous force to do it itself. That's why it's taken so long. Do you think we would have taken all this time, two plus years, to defeat Daesh if we had committed the entire strength of the US military? The answer is, of course not. We would have done it much more quickly. But we would have had difficulty getting out. That's the problem. And would have radicalized a huge segment of the Middle East population in the process. So your question is really good. It's a really important question. And it certainly was in the mind of President Obama a central dimension of his decision making. And I think he made the right decision. We could have probably put some more people in earlier to get more Iraqis going. But just very quickly, we couldn't find half the Iraqi army when we went in. Uh, in late spring of 14, when it came apart, uh, four Iraqi army divisions just evaporated. <laughs> and Daesh got almost all of their equipment. Uh, they, we, we saw the Islamic State coming down Route 1, which is along the Tigris River, headed for Baghdad. The U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and the international embassies there, in our case anyway, it's the largest embassy, U.S. Embassy in the world. And Daesh was coming right down the road. It was cutting people's heads off, crucifying Christians. It was assassinating or, or executing hundreds and hundreds of prisoners. Videotaping it all, putting it all on social media, which was terrifying the army forces that were ahead of them. It was a brilliant move on information operations. <clears throat> if we hadn't started bombing them, we would likely have been witness to the evacuation of the largest American embassy on the planet. Um, those kinds of decisions are very hard. The president had to make that decision like this. The decision was to save Kurdistan and to stop Daesh's uh, pell-mell move towards uh, Baghdad. And I was with the Kurds um, shortly after the fighting stabilized the situation. Daesh was headed south. It made the terrible strategic blunder of heading to the east to try to take down Erbil in Kurdistan. And uh, I was having dinner with the, uh, his name was Nurchavan Barzani. He may have heard of Masood Barzani, his father, who's the president of the Kurds. Uh, he was telling me that they, they could hear the, um, the, the mortars that Daesh had, they could hear the mortars outside Erbil. They were getting so close. And the Kurds knew because the Peshmerga, which are the great Kurdish fighters, had fought desperately to try to keep the ISIL at arm's length, but had literally run out of ammunition in some place. All of their men had been killed in position. The wonderful fighters. Um, he said that this moment of desperation, they didn't know whether the Kurds would be snuffed out because they just witnessed what had happened to the Yazidis, if you'll recall. And then he said the President of the United States made the decision to defend the Kurds. He said, and then we heard the 2,000 pound bombs going in on top of Daesh from Erbil, and the, air, the transport aircraft began to land at the airport in Erbil, and American special forces began to get off. He said, we knew we had been saved, that America had come. So a very special moment. Um, your question is really good. It's a really important question. There is no easy answer to it. Every situation is different. Every country is different. Every security threat is different. We have to have leaders with the strategic vision to see deep about what should be our national objectives, but be able to perceive in close uh, 
to see how we fashion our forces and the f forces of our coalition to be able to achieve the, the most effect in the shortest period of time. I think with that, there's a hook somewhere in my future. <laughs> Forgive me for doing this, but I want to be respectful of your time and our speaker's time. So we'll draw the technical part of our program to a close. But uh, John, if you can stay mm -hmm. a couple minutes, we, mm -hmm. if, if you want to stay and follow to. up with a question, sure. we'll, we'll still have some time. But thank you very much for coming out and joining us. Thank, thank you, you very sir. much. Honored to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What? Ten and three weeks on the 22nd. There might be. When we'll turn to domestic policy and talk.